being recorded, so I've pressed the record button right now. We will not record the Q&A part, and uh, you'll be sent a copy of the recording later on. Uh, the presentation is a general overview of the student route only and does not constitute legal advice. Um, so what I'm going to do today is give you a general overview of the route uh, as well as of the rights and responsibilities you have uh, while holding a student visa and a couple of options that you have if you want to work in the UK after your studies. Uh, what I cannot do is go into specifics about your individual circumstances. So if you have any questions about how any of the immigration law we're going to be discussing today applies to your individual circumstances, your family circumstances, then the best thing to do would be to speak to the student support team at the institution where you're studying. Um, Webcams and microphones are not enabled during the presentation, just to give, keep things easy. Uh, if we save questions at the end of the presentation, then you'll be able to use the chat box at the right of your screen uh, afterwards. Okay, so moving on, uh, as I said, the contents. So first of all, we're going to go over the eligibility and requirements that you need to meet uh, in order to make a student visa application. So that would be in case you need more time to complete your programme or if you decide to study another uh, degree programme in the UK. Uh, we're going to be discussing rights and responsibilities on the student visa, so things like working in the UK. And then after, we're going to be talking about the doctor extension scheme and the graduate route. Both of those are options that will allow you to remain in the UK to work after your studies. Um, I'm not going to go uh, to discuss um, other routes such, such as the skilled worker route or global talent visa because I've been made aware that you have another session coming up uh, that will be looking at those uh, immigration categories in a little bit more detail. So um, let's start. Uh, student route visa. Uh, so you might be aware that it replaced the tier four um, route on the 5th of October 2020. There's no a huge amount of changes. It's a different name and the immigration rules have changed. So they're different, but um, it's broadly similar to tier four. Uh, however, there are some improvements and we're going to be looking at those. It's a full of sponsor route, so you still need to have the sponsorship of the institution where you're going to be studying, and you still need a confirmation of acceptance for studies or CAS. Um, it's not a route that leads to settlement in the UK. Um, so once you lived in uh, the UK for five years on a student visa, you're not going to be able to apply for an indefinite leave to remain. Although uh, the time you spend on a student route visa can potentially lead to settlement by the 10-year route. Um, I'm not going to go on, um, over that today because it's not something that I personally specialise in, uh, but if you're thinking about settling in the UK, I would uh, uh, advise you that you speak to an immigration lawyer or solicitor with um, expertise in the area. Um, you'll know this already, hopefully, but the introduction of this new student route does not affect uh, the visa that you currently hold, so you care for a visa. Uh, I noticed somebody putting their hand up, so I'm not going to be taking questions during the presentation, just to keep things straightforward. So if you can save your questions for the end of the presentation, I'm going to ask you to type uh, the questions into the chat box. So what kind of study can you do on a student visa? Um, so you can do a range of courses, um, but they do need to meet certain requirements, including minimum level qualifications. So you can study a full-time course that leads to a qualification that's a degree level or above, so RQF level six, seven, and eight. Um, a recognised foundation programme for postgraduate doctors or dentists, or um, in some cases, you can also do a part-time course that, uh, that, that needs to be at RQF level 7 or above, so that's postgraduate level, although this is not possible at all UK institutions. For example, the university I work at, the University of Edinburgh, does not sponsor uh, part-time students under the student route at present. So you will need to check with the institution you're studying at. Uh, you might also be aware that there are time limits under the student route. 
so you're only allowed a certain amount of time um, under the studying on a student visa. Uh, it's the same with tier four, uh, although there are a couple of differences. Um, so whenever you um, commence, you apply for a new program of studies, the sponsor you'll be studying at should check that you have enough time left on uh, um, under the time limit to complete the program. Um, they should do, do that before they issue the student with a CAS. The reason for that is that the Home Office will also check that you have enough time left under the time limit. And if they see that you're going to go over that, they're going to refuse the application. So it's very important that um, you have enough time uh, to complete the program. So uh, what are the time limits? For programs below degree level, the time limit is set at two years. I think most of you will be students at degree level, so that would not really affect you. If you're studying a degree level, so undergraduate program, the time limit is set of five years, although there are certain exceptions. For example, if you are studying medicine or architecture, uh, those are exam subjects and you can take as long as you like. The good news is that uh, with the introduction of the uh, student route, the time limit for postgraduate programs has been removed. So, um, you know, if you want to do a PhD and then a further PhD, that's not a problem anymore uh, in terms of time limits. So that's obviously very welcome news. Um, what kind of documents do you need when you make a student visa application? So those are broadly similar to what you would need if you uh, make a tier for visa application. Uh, so you would need a confirmation of acceptance for studies or CAS issued by the sponsor you'll be signing with. Uh, you need a valid passport. Um, you need a BRP if you're applying from the UK because you need evidence uh, that you have the right to live here. Uh, financial evidence to cover your tuition fees and living costs. And we're going to be looking at that in a little bit more detail in a moment. In some cases, you may need a uh, evidence of the qualification you use to gain your offer are you think, at the institution you want to study at, official translations if you have any documents that are not in English, depending on you, the subject you are studying and your nationality you might need an academic technology approval scheme or ATA certificate, um, depending on where you're applying from you may need to get a CB certificate, we're going to be looking at those two in a little bit more detail as well. Uh, if you are making your application uh, inside the UK and you are a nationality that is required to register with the police, you will need to submit a police registration certificate as they said with your current visa, passport and UK address. And if you are sponsored, if you have sponsorship, financial sponsorship from um, your home government or an international scholarship agency, then you will need the consent to make the application and to remain in the UK. So moving on, uh, looking at financial evidence, how much money do you need? So you need the unpaid tuition fees stated in your CAS plus £9,207 per living cost for living costs. Um, that information can change. Immigration law in the UK is very changeable. Uh, however, it is accurate as of today. Um, if you are applying inside of the UK and you have lived here for at least 12 months with a valid visa, then you will automatically meet the financial requirement and you do need to submit evidence of your funds. So again, that's another change that was introduced with the student visa. And it's obviously news because, you know, um, less documents you to the home office. Uh, the kind of money that you need to you can use, so you need to have cash funds that are in your name or your parents' legal guardian names. Um, now you can also use money in your partner's name uh, as long if they on, but only if they are present in the UK and applying at the same time as you. So in only only in those specific circumstances. Um, you can also have a scholarship um, from your home government, a university or an international company or a, a scholarship organisation. So if CARA, for example, are acting as of your financial sponsor, you can use the award letter that they provide you with to meet the financial requirements. 
In some cases, you can also use uh, uh, federal um, scholarships, uh, loans. Uh, so these are loans that are provided by a government or a government sponsored student loan company. A classic example of that is uh, our federal loans in the United States, uh, although uh, I think uh, quite a lot of Indian banks offer that service. The important thing with that is that it can just be any bank loan that needs to be a loan that is part of an academic or an educational loan scheme. Um, I mentioned earlier on that in some cases you may need to submit evidence of uh, uh, your qualifications. Um, so if you are studying at um, a higher education provider with a track record of compliance, and you are studying a program at degree level or above, you don't actually need to submit that. That's yet another change that's come in with the, uh, the introduction of the student route. Um, you should check with your university whether they meet that description. Um, but in that case, yeah, that's yet another document you don't need to submit. However, if you don't meet those requirements, you need to submit evidence of those. What you can use is the certificate of the qualification, like for example, the degree certificate. You can also use a transcript of the results as long as uh, it confirms that you have been awarded your qualification. Or finally, the other thing you can use is the printout of the qualification with transcript results from the awarding body's online checking service. Um, an example of that is the International Baccalaureate that had that service available for uh, students. Just want to tell us a bit about ATAS, um, so uh, the Academic Technology Approval Scheme. So this is a form of clearance that you need for certain science and technology subjects, usually only a postgraduate level. So whether you need it or not depends on your program, the nature of your program and your nationality. Uh, certain nationalities are exempt from ATAS requirements now. Um, to find out whether you need ATAS when you make your visa application, speak to your sponsor. Generally, it is confirmed on the offer letter they give you, but it's probably different across institutions. So speak to um, your student support team and they'll be able to confirm whether ATAS is required for you. If it is needed, um, you can apply online. It's a free application. It's fairly straightforward as well. Uh, one thing you need to bear in mind, however, is that it takes four to six weeks to be processed. It takes quite a long time to make sure that you time things accordingly. The certificate itself is valid for six months, um, so it will last you a little bit of time once it's granted. Um, this is applicable to new programs that require uh, ATIS clearance. It is also applicable if you're studying on a program that requires ATIS and you need to extend your visa, for example, if you have repeated a year or you need more time because you are a PhD student, then in most cases the ATIS requirement will still apply and you will need to apply for a new certificate. But do speak to your uh, international student support team and they'll be able to advise you or, and to let you know whether the requirement is applicable to your circumstances. A TB certificate, um, if you're making an application from within the UK, generally it's not something that you need to worry about. However, if you have been outside of the UK for um, more than six months and you have been in a country that requires TB testing, then you will need to get a new certificate prior to making a visa application. There is guidance on the government website that you can refer to. Um, again, that speaks to your institution as well because it will be able to let you know whether that is something that you need to worry about or not. So that pretty much covers the um, documents that you need to submit when you make a visa, uh, a student visa application. But where can you make your application from? That depends on a number of things. Um, but generally, uh, you might have two options depending on your circumstances. In most cases, you'll be able to make your application from your home country. Um, so by that, I mean your country or nationality or the country you uh, are habitually resident in. So this is a country uh, where you're living for a purpose other than a short term visit. So just to give you an example, let's say you're a student from Iran and you are um, studying in Canada for a year and you have a student visa. In that case, you'll be able to make your application from Canada. You would not need to go back from Iran, Iran in order to make the application. 
But let's say the same student goes to Italy for three weeks for a holiday, they will not be able to apply from there because they're only there for a short period of time as tourists. So they will need to go back to Iran to make the application. So it really depends on how long you have been in uh, your country residence for. Can you apply from the UK? Well, this depends on your circumstances and this is something that um, I would always encourage you to check with uh, the advisors at your institution prior to making the application. On a general level, you can make an application from the UK if you have valid permission to be here uh, that is not in one of the following categories, and you see those on the screen, so you should not be here as a visitor, as a short-term student, as a parent of a child student, a seasonal worker, domestic worker in a private household, or if you have permission to be in the UK outside of the immigration rules. The other thing you need to bear in mind is also the gap between uh, your current visa expiry date and the start date of your program as it appears on your CAS. The the gap should not be greater than 28 days. So it's something else that you need to check. There's also other requirements that you need to refer to uh, when you make your application from the UK. So generally, you're expected to meet uh, a requirement known as the academic progression requirement. Um, this is applicable if you have been previously granted leave under the tier four or student route. So if you're in that situation, um, the academic progression requirement um, will essentially um, mean that you have to have completed, successfully completed the program for which your visa was granted. So you should have achieved the award um, for the program uh, the visa was issued. There's also a requirement in terms of the new course. So generally it needs to be a higher level than your previous program. Or if it is at the same level, uh, it needs to be complementary. So that means that it needs to be deeper spe specialization um, with respect to the previous program. And if it isn't, uh, you should ensure that the previous program and the program you want to study combined support your career aspirations. It can be a little bit convoluted, the requirement, and um, students can sometimes struggle to understand what the home office means by these words. So what would always suggest if you're in this situation, speak to your um, local uh, student immigration advisor and they'll be able to let you know whether you're likely to meet the requirements or not and whether you're able to make your application from the UK. There's a number of exceptions as well uh, to the academic uh, progression rule. For example, if you're a PhD student and you need more time to finish uh, the same programme, the programme you're currently on, you're exempt from that. If you have previously repeated a year of your program and you need more time because of that, you're also exempt. And there's also, in some cases, concessions for Syrian nationals. We're going to be looking at that in a moment. Again, speak to your institution. Always speak to your student immigration advisor prior to making an application, as you know that can make a difference between a successful or unsuccessful application. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give you a note about uh, Syrian concessions. Um, so. Um, a few years ago, the UK government introduced concessions for Syrian nationals. So there's a uh, Syrian nationals that are present in the UK and whose country of habitual residence is Syria and have that limited leave to enter or remain. So for example, a student visa will qualify you for that. Uh, the concessions are being renewed on a yearly basis. Um, the concessions that are currently published expired on the 31st of December 2020. And there's no, not be a notification of those being renewed, uh, but I suspect they will be renewed. I did get in touch with the Home Office a few weeks ago to get that confirmed from them, but so far they haven't got back to me. Uh, so would, what would suggest, if you're hoping to rely on these concessions to try and make an application from the UK, for example, uh, speak to your institution first, and they'll be able to get in touch with the Home Office and see if you can still qualify under them. If you're qualified for these concessions and the concessions are renewed, generally you might be able to make your application from within the UK where you're normally required to make it from outside of the UK. There's also flexibility in terms of time limits and in terms of the documents you might need to submit. But again, speak to your student immigration advisor to your institution because you need to make sure that the concessions are definitely still in place and that you're definitely eligible for them prior to making your application. 
So moving on to the next section of the uh, presentation, we're going to be looking at the rights and responsibilities that you have while you hold a student visa. So a student visa allows you to do a number of things. Uh, so you can obviously study with your immigration sponsor, so that's your university, and you can also take on additional studies if you like. Um, you know, you could do, for example, recreational courses such as an art course, or you can do a language uh, evening class. The, the thing you need to bear in mind is that the additional studies that you take on should not interfere with your main degree program. Um, you can take additional studies at your current university or also with another institution. You're also allowed to work. If you're studying a degree level program, you can work up to 20 hours per week and uh, during term time and you can work full time during your holiday periods. Um, in terms of work as well though, uh, we're going to be looking at working during your studies in a, bit, a little bit of detail later on, uh, but the, in terms of the type of work you can take on, uh, uh, you should bear in mind that there are restrictions. So the first one is that you're not allowed to take on permanent work, um, so the contract that you take on needs to be fixed there. You shouldn't engage in business activity, and we're going to look at what that means in a moment. You can't work as an entertainer or a sports person, and you should not be self-employed. It's very, very important that you're careful with the type of employment that you take on, because if you, for example, start a company when you are on a Tier 4 student visa, that will be a breach of your visa condition that can land you in a lot of trouble. So be very careful uh, with the type of work that you take on. In terms of uh, the other rights that you have as a student visa holder. So if you're studying a postgraduate program of nine months or more, or if you're an undergraduate student uh, the, on a course that over at least six months and you're sponsored by your home government, you can bring certain family members known as dependents to the UK. Um, I have another slide later on that looks into that in a bit, bit more detail. You also have a number of responsibilities, so you need to comply with all the conditions attached to your visa. Uh, for example, you're not allowed to access public funds, such as unemployment benefit or child benefit. Uh, you need to register with the police if that is applicable uh, to your nationality, and you need to make sure that uh, you work within the restrictions of the visa. You also need to ensure that you leave the UK before your visa expiry date. Um, sometimes students think that that there is a grace period past the visa expiry date. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case at all. So you need to ensure you either leave the UK before your visa expires or that you have made an application to remain a bit prior to that date. My recommendation as well would be uh, most universities in the UK will have in-house immigration advice and you will most likely have a student support team so if there are any changes in your circumstances, like for example, you want to take an interruption of studies, you need to repeat a year, um, then speak to your student immigration team, your student support team, because that kind of change can have an impact on your student visa. So that's very important. Always seek uh, timely advice prior to any changes taking place. Police registration, so I uh, just wanted to remark on that because that's an important one. So um, if you're required to register with the police, you normally need to do it within seven days of arriving in the UK. Obviously, there's been a little bit of flexibility with that, with COVID and all the various restrictions. Uh, for example, here in Scotland, uh, the local po uh, police office had to close down because of lockdown. Um, so during that time, students were not required to register. But generally, that is the rule, and you should ensure that you register as soon as possible when you arrive. Once you have a certificate, you also need to be careful because every time you get a new visa, a new passport, or every time you change your address, you need to take your certificate with the local police. And you normally need to do it within seven days of the change taking place. The police department dealing with police registration is called the Overseas Visitor Registration Office. Um, local police forces have a team that is dedicated to that, and they normally have websites that are really good and they give you full information. So you can refer to that, or again, you can speak to your student support team and they'll be able to give you guidance in terms of changes that need to be reported, 
also as well if you lose a certificate you need to replace it in a timely manner so things like that you need to be careful with the police registration requirements so sometimes you'll come across students that changed flats like a year ago but they're not updated the certificate so don't get into that kind of situation be very mindful of your certificate and what needs to be reported on it Another thing that you need to be careful with is if you travel outside of the UK during your studies, always speak to your institution and always seek permission. Don't just you know, go away for a couple of months without telling anyone because that can obviously have an impact on uh, uh, the validity of your visa. So uh, as I was saying earlier, always seek timely advice from the student support team. Um, your student support officer, your immigration advisor will be able to tell you what travel you're permitted to do and what documents you may need to re-enter the UK. So seek the advice before uh, you do anything like that. Uh, well, a couple of slides on work now. So um, you'll remember that I said earlier that you're not allowed to um, take on business activity, engage in business activity or be self-employed. So the Home Office defined business activity as working for a business in a capacity other than an employee in which you have a financial or other significant beneficial interest. Um, they give a few examples of what constitutes business, business activity. Uh, for example, you're not allowed to set up, set up a business that is trading or has a trading pres presence. You cannot be employed in a company in which you hold shares of 10% or more or work for a company where you hold a role such as director. Um, the examples are limited to that, but there'll be more that constitutes a business activity. So my suggestion would be if you're taking on work that is uh, a little bit different, like you're not getting your standard employee contract, Speak to your student advisor and just make sure that, that it doesn't constitute business activity. It's the same as of employment as well. Um, normally, if you're not on an employer's payroll and uh, you know you're asked to work as a contractor or manage your own workload and tax, that is likely to constitute self-employment. That's a big no-no under the student visa or tier for visa rules. So you need to be very careful with that. Um, in terms of the work that you can do, so as I mentioned earlier, if you are doing a degree level program and you're sponsored by um, an institution with a track record of compliance, you can work up to 20 hours per week during term time. Uh, week is defined as a seven day period starting on a Monday and term time is the period uh, in which you're expected to study. So you're allowed to work full time during your holidays. Uh, you need to be careful with that because um, institutions will have like an academic calendar and uh, defined holidays. So you need to make sure that you're working full time during a, a period that is defined as a holiday period by your institution. Usually, for example, the winter break or the spring break will be um, a holiday period. But do refer to your local academic calendar because that would be the best guidance. Um, there's also really good guidance in terms of the work that you can and cannot do uh, that's been published by an organization called the UK Council for International Student Affairs or UKISA. You might be familiar with them. They have lots of really useful uh, visa information on their website and they have uh, a blog that is particularly useful uh, because it goes through all the types of work that you cannot and cannot do kind of do excuse me so um have a look at that in your own time uh, and you may find it quite useful dependence of students you remember earlier that um if you i mentioned that if you're a student a postgraduate student on a program of nine months or more or if you are an undergraduate student on a program uh, that is like six months long and you're sponsored by your home government then you can bring certain family members to the uk with you those family members are known as your dependents. So they're your spouse, your civil partner, you're a married partner, but only if you have been living together for a period of at least two years and you can evidence that and any children under the age of 18. So uh, they can apply at the same time as you. Uh, for example, if you're applying from overseas and you want your spouse to come with you to the UK, you can make, apply at the same time, although your family member would need to submit their own application form and they will need to submit uh, their own evidence. 
Um, they can also apply separately. Say, for example, you're in the UK, you're here or not here for a student visa, and uh, your spouse is back overseas and they want to join in the UK, then they will be able to submit an application from the whole country to come and live here with you. Um, again, um, most uh, institutions in the UK uh, will uh, offer advice to students when it comes to the comes to dependent applications. So speak to your student support team, and they should be able to uh, give you advice on dependent applications, whether your uh, spouse is eligible to come as your dependent, and the type of documents that you need to submit. Dependent visas always come, also come with a number of rights and responsibilities attached to them. So they also require to register with the police if that is applicable. So that will depend on their nationality. And they should also ensure that they not access public funds such as unemployment benefit, child benefit, and things like that. They can study. Uh, if ATAS is required, uh, they will need to obtain that prior to commencing their program. So remember, ATAS is a form of clearance that you need to get for certain science and technology subjects. They can work. Um, they're more restricted in terms of the hours they can work, which is great. So they're a bit luckier than students. But they're not allowed to work as doctors or dentists. Um, and they're not allowed to work as professional sports persons, but that's pretty much the only restrictions the subject is in terms of work. Okay, so moving on to the final part of the presentation, we're going to be looking at a couple of options that you have if you want to stay in the UK after your studies to work. The first one is the Doctor Extension Scheme. Um, you may be familiar with this visa route already. So this is a scheme that the UK government introduced a few years ago, and it's open to doctoral level or PhD students. Um, and it allows them to stay in the UK for an additional 12 months to work or look for work. You need to check whether your institution normally supports doctor extension scheme applications. I think um, if I have a tier four student visa license, generally most will do, but double check. And if they're happy to support you, what they need to do is assign you with a, a confirmation of acceptance for studies or CAS. And that needs to happen in the 60 day period prior to the expected end date of your program. So the expected end date is defined by the Home Office as the date the PhD is expected to be formally confirmed by the sponsor as completed to the standard required for the award of a PhD. So it's when you actually finish your PhD and you complete your course. So generally, you need to wait until you've had your viva before you can apply. The application needs to be submitted from within the UK. It cannot be submitted from overseas. It does allow dependents, so if you have family with you in the UK and they want to apply with you, that is allowed. Um, the only thing to bear in mind with the doctor extension scheme, if you're coming up towards the end of your course now, is that the route is expected to close and merge with the graduate route on the 1st of July 2021. Um, the reason for that is that the graduate route will essentially be more generous than the doctor extension scheme visa. So um, you know, the two routes are essentially merging. Um, if you're coming up, uh, about to finish your program around about this time and your visa expires in the summer, speak to one of your advisors at your institution because they'll be able to let you know whether you're eligible for the graduate route. And if that case, you may prefer to rather than a doctor extension scheme because as we see, we'll see in a moment, the graduate route will allow you to remain in the UK for a little bit longer. So the graduate route. I have to apologize, the slides are gone a little bit funny on Collaborate, but hopefully when you're sent a copy of them later on, uh, that won't be the case. Um, so the graduate route has uh, uh, attracted quite a lot of interest from students uh, with good reason. So this is the, um, a route that was announced in 2019 by the UK government, and it's taken us a wee while to get here. Uh, details have sort of trickled through in the last two year period. But uh, now we know that it will launch on the 1st of July 2021. And students who have completed a degree at undergraduate, postgraduate level uh, at a higher education provider with a track record of compliance will be able to apply for it as long as they had a valid tier four visa or student visa at the time of application. So in order to be eligible, you need to be in the UK 
with a valid tier four or student visa, and you need to have successfully completed a degree level program. Um, the good news is that the graduate route buys you a good period of time. So um, you're allowed two years to work for work any sector at any level. So you do need to have a job offer in order to be eligible uh, to, for the visa, which is great news. Um, also, if you have uh, successfully obtained a PhD or other doctoral qualification, you'll be given three years on the route. So that's a significant amount of time. You're normally expected to have completed your programme in the UK, uh, but there are a number of concessions for students that have been stuck overseas because of COVID. Uh, those will depend on the programme that you've studied and how long you've studied overseas. So I would suggest that you speak to your institution about uh, your situation. If you have, have been required to spend time overseas because of COVID, and they'll be able to let you know whether you're still eligible for the graduate route. Um, it's not extendable, so the visa lasts two years or three years and cannot be extended. However, if you find work during that time that is eligible for the skilled worker route, for example, skilled worker is the visa route that replaced tier two, then you'll be able to switch to, tier two, to the skilled worker visa from within the UK. Uh, it allows work, including self-employment and voluntary work. Uh, the only uh, restriction is that you're not allowed to work as a professional sports person. You're also allowed to have dependents while on the route, but the family member already needs to be in the UK as your dependent. So if you have a spouse overseas, for example, uh, they're not yet applied, they don't already hold leave in the UK as your dependent, they will not be eligible when you apply for the graduate route. Unfortunately, uh, that's going to be a little bit difficult for students. For example, you've met someone during your time in the UK and they're not yet your dependent. I guess the only solution would be for them to make an application as your dependent while you still hold a tier four or a student visa and then they'll be able to switch to the graduate route. Although obviously that implies that you need to make two visa applications. Um, I'm sure you're aware the costs of those are in, insignificant. If you have children that were born in the UK while you were here as students and they don't already hold a visa, they will of course be able to apply as your dependent. So that's the exception. Uh, the graduate route is quite expensive. So the application fee is £700 and the immigration health surcharge will be £624 per year of the visa. Both of those are payable at the time of application in full. So for example, if you're a PhD student and you're applying for a graduate route visa, you will need to pay 700 plus 624 plus times three. So it's obviously a considerable cost, uh, but as I said, it will buy you quite a long time in the UK, so it might be a worthwhile investment for quite a lot of people. So that's uh, the uh, post-study visa options that I wanted to focus on with you. Um, colleagues like Clara have made me aware that there, are, there is another session coming up that will be focusing on other possible visa routes, such as skill worker on the Global Talent Visa, and I will be able to give you more details on that. So uh, here we are, to the Q&A session. Uh, we got about 20 minutes. So if you have any questions at all about the student route, about the doctor extension scheme or the graduate route, bearing in mind that they need to be general questions, please type them in into the chat box and I'll be very, very happy to answer them. I'm going to stop recording now. As well.